Well, let's uh, kick off the first panel. The uh, first panel, <clears throat> the moderator for the first panel uh, discussion is Dr. Mike Stice, uh, who I mentioned earlier is the dean of the Mewburn College of Earth and Energy at OU. Uh, Mike is a University of Oklahoma alum and an energy leader with, <clears throat> excuse me, more than 35 years of um, industry experience working worldwide. I've been fortunate to call Mike a friend for over 40 years, and I can tell you that he is one of the best in the business. He began his career in Oklahoma, but has worked all over the world in leadership positions uh, during most of his career, including many countries in the Far East as well as, well as the Middle East. In 2008, uh, we were fortunate he came back and joined Chesapeake and served as president of Chesapeake's Midstream Development um, and also Chief Executive Officer of Chesapeake Midstream Partners, which many of you know became known as Access Midstream. And in 2015, he retired and accepted the position as Dean of the Mewburn School of Earth and Energy at, at OU. He earned his uh, chemical engineering degree from OU, a master's degree in business from Stanford, an international director diploma from Sydney University, and then in 2011, he completed his doctorate um, of education at George Washington University. I'm not sure what classes he's taken right now. Uh, um, uh, he, uh, as you, you can imagine, and suffice it to say that he's very well qualified to serve as moderator of the first panel. So, Mike, I'll turn it over to you, and thank you. Thank you, Jay. Um, we agreed we weren't going to talk about the 40 years, by the way. That was a quiet conversation. But... Uh, Anyway, it's really my pleasure to moderate today's panel and, and talk about the future role of hydrocarbons. I'm joined here today by some really distinguished guests. Uh, to my left is Andrew Burton, who is the CEO at B2 Analytics. Andrew will bring, uh, I think, some insights for all of us on the impact that the LNG side of the business is bringing uh, to the natural gas business here in North America and globally. Uh, to his left is uh, Michael Ming. I always have a, try, a hard time keeping up with Mike's titles, uh, so I'm going to read it for us. Vice President, Executive Liaison for Marketing Technology at BHGE. BHGE is something you have to get down now. It's Baker Hughes, comma, a GE company. So welcome, Michael. Mike and I have been friends for a long time, and so this is a great opportunity for us to interact with, with you and answer questions around technology and the impact technology is going to have on our hydrocarbon business. And then uh, finally, uh, Dr. Joseph Stanislaw, Stanislaw this, uh, he doesn't need any introduction, okay? He's, he, there's not a, many subjects he can't talk about. And so we proved that last night at dinner. Uh, I'm thrilled that, that he's joining us. Uh, uh, Joe is a senior partner at Bright Star Capital Partners. And so I know Daniel already left, but I have to say, uh, you know, Daniel Pullen makes this come together, uh, his leadership and his ability to, to look at the energy industry as a cross-disciplinary function. Uh, University of Oklahoma is very fortunate to have him and other deans that collaborate across the board. And then, of course, Jay's leadership and the Energy Institute has been very much appreciated. So thank you both. Um, so to get started right away, um, I'm going to start with you, Joe, because I think we need the macro perspective right away. The subject today is the future role of hydrocarbons. And last symposium, for those of you who are here, we talked a lot about the social license and we talked about the concerns and the consequences, environmental consequences specifically, of hydrocarbons, whether it be local issues as we face with induced seismicity or whether it be climate change, et cetera. Um, that has given rise to uh, more emphasis on renewables. And I'm asking the question more basically, renewables and hydrocarbons, um, Friends or foes? Uh, good morning, everybody, and I thank uh, you for having me back. I hope I don't overdo my welcome by being here again. Uh, I was pre briefed on this question about two minutes before we all started. And while the introduction was taking place, I thought about this, and then I heard the words 40 years. I'm going to go backwards in time to, to start this conversation, because I think we have to. Uh, I entered the academic world in 1975. I don't look that old, but in 1975. I was part of a three-person team that created the first energy research group in the world at Cambridge University. Myself, an economist, a very famous physicist, and a very famous uh, engineer. I was the low guy in the totem pole, but as they needed an economist, they chose me, lucky me. I mean, really lucky me. We chose the word energy. Uh, that was a time which we all thought were running out of all forms of energy, if you go backwards in time. Limits to growth, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. 
Uh, we can roll forward to right now. We talk about renewables, fossil fuels. Back in 75, we thought we were running out. So we started thinking about other technologies. Renewables didn't exist. They did exist in principle. We knew about wind and solar. We didn't have the technologies. But people were writing about them. We even did experiments in India on small-scale biomass systems. You, you, know, you had a, a garbage can. You put a lid on it, put a pipe up, and you put cow dung in there. And you got methane, you lit it at the end, you had a light bulb, basically. Little things like that. Some of the very famous uh, Schumacher, you have Schumacher wrote about small is beautiful. We were thinking then, if we're short of energy, we had to have appropriate energy and appropriate technology for different needs around the world. Not one size fit all. There was a violent argument at that point in time about large scale, small scale technologies. Schumacher tried to fight that and said appropriate technology. But it was really a big issue. You, may, you guys just don't remember this, but it was really a big issue. You had to have big centralized systems, state controlled systems. Uh, and we talked about the small scale stuff, but we just didn't have the technology. You fast forward to today, and those guys had great vision, the Schumachers uh, and, and others. Uh, uh, and we now have the technologies. We have a lot of energy in the world, but we also don't have a lot of energy in the world. You know, one million, two million people live on nothing, hardly have any energy at all. And the energy they're using uh, is not very healthy, uh, basically. But we have the technology that can solve all these problems. You look at today, the fight is, well, you're renewables, I don't like you. I'm oil and gas. You know, we have to win the game. My hat off to the Price Institute, it's energy, right, in Oklahoma. It's not Oil and Gas Institute, it's energy. There's a space in this market for everything. We need all forms of energy, and the technologies producing the new and renewables, renewables, solar, wind, et cetera, and those technologies producing economic, low-cost natural gas, low-cost oil, more environmentally uh, pop, uh, cr uh, created oil and gas, this is all technology. It's all moving in the same direction. They're not enemies. It's not large scale, small scale. It's where we have what we can do. It just depends where you are. Costs are coming down dramatically all over the place on all forms of energy. If we ever put the price of carbon into the system, the winds, the solars, et cetera, will be even cheaper than the oil and gases who don't have the, to worry about the price of carbon. Last night, the subject was mentioned about subsidies for, oil, uh, for these new renewables. They don't need subsidies, basically. Uh, and they're, they're, they've already come down. I was on the board of the company, the biggest investor in solar power in the world, Good Energy Zinc, owned by a family. We're investing 3 billion euros in solar, biggest producer in the world. We're talking about dollar, two dollars, whatever the unit is, kilowatt or kilowatt. I don't know what the units are. I'm very bad at that. It's down to nothing now. And the prices are still coming down. And we haven't even talked about AI, big data, and that kind of stuff yet. Uh, and Bitcoins and cryptocurrency is going to transform this whole world. So my basic answer to, I said 1975 and 76, it ain't one or the other. We need all forms of energy. There will be transitions from more dominance to less dominance, but we need them all. To get to tomorrow in a world that will be sustainable, underlying sustainable in every sense of the word, we need to have oil and gas as a bridge and then oil and gas as a solution along with complementary workings with the solars, with the winds, with conservation, with efficiency. They all go together. And there's no battle between the two. The sooner the oil and gas industry and a lot of the independents wake up to the fact, these are my partners. These are really my partners. The better off I'm going to be. Everyone would be better off for it. And, and the sooner one does that to understand the license to operate, to be in the game, is recognizing all of that and the drive forward. Now, this sounds very polemic. I hate to be lecturing, but it's so strong. We saw it in 1975 and 76. A different battle was being fought. You didn't call it climate change. You talked about the environment. It's all the same thing. And I'll just end with one comment, which I've written about, which is the conventional wisdom, usually in the oil and gas sector, I'm not saying energy, oil and gas sector, says if you address and worry about the environment, you're going limit, to limit economic growth. That is categorically incorrect. That, that conventional wisdom, forget it, throw it out the door. If we do not address the environment properly, including climate change, we're going to limit economic growth. To pro promote economic growth, we address it. 
because the economic benefits of addressing it in oil and gas, in winds and solars, and in conservation efficiency, is going to stimulate economic growth and make the world sustainable. And that's a very sort of big picture, but there you go. Well said. Uh, got all the message we were trying to get in done with the first panelist, so we can go to go, go away now. I think uh, well done, Joe. Uh, you know, I think the the role of technology is often underestimated. Um, you know, we talk about technology in all kinds of fields. You know, whether it be aerospace, uh, medical fields. Uh, but I don't, unfortunately don't think the energy industry gets its due on the amount of technology and the change that technology drives. And so, Mike, you know, as, as the marketing liaison for technology for a major technology company, what are your thoughts both historically on how technology has changed the, the role of fossil fuels, but more importantly, what do you see in the future? Technology, it, it's really stunning what's happened in the move from the scarcity to abundance. So I spent most of my career as an independent producer. My business partner, 25 years sitting in the crowd here. Um, I drilled last time I stood on the rig floor as an operating petroleum engineer was about 15 years ago. And all that technology, all those rigs of the chain driven mechanical rigs, they're, they're quickly becoming museum items, okay? The fact that the supply chain for sand now is the determinant in, in many regards of the price of energy, okay? Um, staggering volumes, uh, whole new ways of thinking about it, recovering hydrocarbons from rocks that we always thought as petroleum engineers could never flow, hydrocarbons, period. So what we're working on now is a whole new way of thinking. So you might look at the Jeff Bezos at Amazon approach um, to what he's done to everyone in this room. He knows more about you than you know about you, okay? And he's characterized that data and made predictions when you log onto the computer what you might be interested in. And now we have to do the same thing with wells and behaviors and so like drilling horizontal wells now, for example, you drill a first well, the parent well, and then you have child wells, okay? And everyone thinks, well, all the child wells are going to perform like the parent well, and, and they actually don't because we, we still don't fully understand why these hydrocarbons and how they flow through this rock that it shouldn't flow through in the first place. And so if you look at the Jeff Bezos model, it's a data-driven model. Historically, we model these reservoirs with conventional physics models, and we're really good at it. But that was in a particular type of rock that was amenable to a physics-based model. And now, if you take a pore throat that's actually smaller than the molecule that's flowing through it, like the molecule has to squeeze its elbows to get through the pore, it shouldn't flow. So now we have to say, okay, Maybe the physics models don't work, so let's use a data-enhanced physics model. And that's some of the things we're working on to get smarter. So, for example, a child well, how are you going to frack that well? What's the, the, the temporal component of a field development? You only get one shot at developing one of these fields, and now you have to be much smarter. So... We're looking at, for example, the interaction from one well to another on a frack. We're looking, for example, at the implementation of many more sensors in field production so that we get continuous data streams instead of single data points. And in my day, a pumper went to a well once a day and took a spot check. Now you get a 24-7, and what we found almost every time with big data is there's a whole lot more going on in the data than we ever thought that was going on. And just use an example from aircraft engines, the reason airplanes have two engines now is the exact same thing. Continuous data streams, incredibly sophisticated analytics, and now we can not only keep engines from failing, we can dramatically lower their maintenance cost, which translates to lower cost to consumers. But that same analogy we can ap apply to the oil and gas industry. So I think we've, we're kind of moving past from making new machines to finding ways to make machines much smarter. And 
the opportunity right now is still wide open. If if you look at recovery factors from the super tight shales uh, in on the oil side, less than 10 percent. Okay, the gas side maybe 20 to 30 percent. But compare that to conventional production, where those respective recovery factors might be 50 percent and 90 percent. A very small increase from five or 10 percent oil recovery factor is a stunning amount of oil. And it's going to come, we think, uh, a lot on the analytic side and the get smarter side. And, and we're actually uh, making a lot of headway there. So Joe confirmed for us that uh, hydrocarbons and renewables are friends, not foes. They're complements, not competitors. I think Mike has told us that the story on technology is not over. Uh, technology continues to add value and increase our opportunities in the fossil fuel business. There are some outcomes, however, aren't there, of uh, increasing fossil fuels, increasing natural gas. We now have an abundance of natural gas and, as a result, relatively low gas prices. And that begs the question for Andrew, um, you know, the LNG export market, um, what does that mean for the natural gas market here in, in North America? Is it going to be the relief valve that many people are looking for to maybe improve gas prices, or is it overstated as it's currently being marketed? Yeah, so LNG, we're in the early innings here of LNG export. Um, obviously, the abundance that we have in North America, um, we've got about six projects, two of them operating currently, so Sabine Pass, which is a senior project. And uh, Cove Point just started about two weeks ago, uh, commissioning cargoes. And we've got four more projects that we really track at, at, at our shop that are past FID under construction, um, and that's uh, Cameron, Elba, uh, Freeport, and Corpus Christi. Um, and so currently, Sabine has been running at very impressive rates, 3.3 BCF a day. One of the things unknown in the gas market going into this winter was um, would, when we had strong pricing here in North America, would Sabine run just at a continuous rate through uh, some cold events? And of course, we really tested the metal on that. In January, January 5th, uh, early part of January, we um, we had a, a, a um, really strong uh, winter and, and cold temperatures in Boston and New York. Uh, and of course, Sabine Pass just chugged right along at 3.3 BCF a day. So that was impressive. The other thing to think about globally is this is the first time as a, a global gas market we've we've put liquefaction on a liquid cash market and a liquid futures market. It's not been done before. Uh, most LNG export has been from disparate areas, um, which were obviously very long supply, very short demand, right? Um, so uh, early innings, um, the North American market, as we look at it, um, we need export and all the export growth. Uh, we are in this period of uh, immense production growth in both oil and gas. Um, and of course, we run into a little bit of a problem in the Permian where too many people have had their oil hat on and not thought about the gas. And you see that in, in very weak basis differentials out in, in Waha and West Texas currently. Um, so, but the, the North American market needs export. And of course, we're exporting uh, roughly three and a half, four BCF a day currently to Mexico, uh, and, and um, mostly out of Texas, uh, Gulf Coast, but also out of South Texas. Um, and then we're also exporting now about 3.3 Bs out of Sabine, and um, Co Point's taken as much as about 500 million a day or half a BCF a day recently, and that that will come on. Our expectation is that um, we have about 10 Bs under construction. If you look, this ramp that is coming, all those projects will mostly be on online by the end of 2019. And of course, if you look at a lot of production forecasts out there and for forecasts that we've done, we have a lot of production growth occurring between now and 2019. Um, and the market needs that because power burn on the gas side is not what it used to be, thanks to renewables, um, thanks to it, uh, gas on gas competition, quite frankly, that's going on uh, with combined very, uh, large gas combined cycles that are coming on actually displacing less efficient gas plants out there. Um, so power is not the, the, the growth um, but or lever that we used to have uh, in the gas market. Um, ResCom, it's hard to get excited about ResCom. I call it the Home Depot effect, uh, building tighter building codes. Um, light bulbs aren't what they used to be. Uh, appliances aren't what they used to be or, or aren't the, when you go buy them, they're more and more efficient. 
And uh, of course, electric load has been flat uh, here in North America since about 2008. Um, so the power market's not that, that, um, that huge piece of demand that could be relied on. And ResCom gas demand is pretty stagnant too, uh, as well. We built a ton of buildings um, in the last 10 years, uh, new homes in North America. And of course, residential demand doesn't, it's not, it's growing, but very slightly, like 1% a year. So, um, and then industrial, yeah, that's great. We have a lot of industrial um, uh, development going on in the Gulf Coast, but um, some of the petrochem plants that are turning online, they do take incremental gas, but it's to the tune of 40, 60, 100 million a day. And you look at Sabine Pass, it's one facility, it takes 3.3 BCF a day. To give you some perspective of how big this plant is, uh, Manhattan uh, takes gas off of Texas Eastern, Transco, and Iroquois. That's the big, the three pipes that really supply Manhattan. On a peak winter day, Con Ed and uh, Keyspan, they take about 3.3 BCF a day. So we've effectively built a Manhattan uh, in, uh, on the Sabine River, effectively. So um, it's the, the, the gas market needs it because we have grown production so much, uh, we need it as a relief valve. Um, of course, Sabine's chugging. This winter, we had Henry Hub price at five dollars, five plus dollars in MMBTU, uh, and Sabine kept plugging on through. So we we now know the answer to that question. Our belief is there will be some seasonality. A lot of the demand in the global LNG market is in the northern hemisphere. There is limited ability to store uh, LNG. You can do it, but in large quantities, it's uh, very capital intensive. Um, and so in the wintertime, you do have this competition for ships that are going on in the northern hemisphere. And so we do think there will be some seasonality, although you talk to the LNG operators and they say, oh, no, these things are going to run 100 percent here in the U.S. But I also have talked to gas marketers and traders who own uh, salt dome storage right by Sabine, and they're licking their chops saying these things are going to trip and I'm going to make a killing. So everyone talks their book, of course. Uh, but uh, um, so the, the, the truth is probably somewhere in the middle. So we model on a go forward basis about um, eight BCF a day of demand uh, that's coming. Uh, and, and we're at about 3.3, 3.5, 3.8 now. Um, so that's, that's an incremental several BCF a day, which is good for the gas market. We need it. We keep revising our IP rates higher. We keep revising lots of stuff higher on the production side. So we need it. So, um, and then globally, don't, don't forget about um, we can compete in this market, we believe. Uh, the good old U.S. contractual law uh, is, is, a, is a definite positive point we see uh, in terms of doing business in the U.S. And then also surprising, a lot of cargoes going to Latin America, cargoes going to China. China seems to have this insatiable appetite for LNG uh, year over year, up 35% in 2017 over 2016. So. Uh, we're excited about LNG. The gas market needs it um, and from a balancing perspective. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, we've made it through our first winter with really solid large volume LNG. It, LNG, Sabine was running last winter, but it wasn't at large volumes. So, Joe, you have a reaction? Two comments, not reactions. I love what you're saying, both of you. Uh, I, you know, I don't come out here enough like I used to. I used to out, out here in the oil patch as such, all the way down in Texas, three or four times a year. Now maybe it's once a year I regret. But I get enthusiastic when I'm here because of the excitement and because of the technology side. I love your comment about parent and child uh, wells. It's, it's a really great analogy. It really is. We all can relate to that. Those children all behave differently for different reasons, uh, uh, which we can't explain. But I'm sure we could do better on oil wells explaining it. Uh, but I want to make a, com a technology comment and a market comment uh, on both these terrific comments. Uh, when I was talking about, you know, this industry here, uh, the oil and gas industry, and the license to operate. I remember speaking at the IPAA two or three times back 10 years ago, eight years ago, seven years ago, to big annual conferences. And I was talking about this compatibility between the winds, the solars, and natural gas, because it really is compatible. Uh, and I also said to them, I said, you guys, are, you guys aren't doing yourself a service. Every time a new environmental regulation comes along, you moan, you complain, you argue, we can't do it, we can't do it. Two years later, you're, you do it, and your overall cost structure is lower. Why do you moan and complain? Just say, we can do it, and get credit for the fact you're playing the game correctly. You're winning at the game. Because you always create the technology. I don't know how you guys do it. I mean, it's really unbelievable. The technology changes I've seen in almost 45 years, year after year. You don't get any credit for it because you don't, you don't talk about it. You argue. I don't want to do that. You're putting my cost up. Well, it does 
in the short term. But each time a new reg comes in, you move faster to make it more economic overall for your production, which is tremendous technology feat. You're technology companies. You aren't getting credit for it. So my hat's off to you, seriously. Now, on, on, on Andrew's comment, what you're talking about is, I never really liked this, this law, because it's a French economist. Now, I lived in France for 20 plus years. They think differently from us. I'm not in a bad way, but differently. This is Cartesian logic, which I can't, I have no logic at all. But says law, supply will create its own demand. That's exactly what the shale gas has done in this country. Not in the United States hasn't created demand, but it helped unlock restricted regional gas markets and made natural gas into a global market. That's what our non-conventional gas did. It broke open a rigid, regional structured gas market into a global market. Our shale gas produced a global gas market. Why? Supply needed some place to go. And we're not foolish. We're not going to find it and not try to do anything with it. We're going to try and sell it. We broke open and created an international gas market. Do you know how powerful that is? People said that couldn't be done. It would never happen. It all had to be connected by pipelines. Our supply did that because of technology. And supply does create its own demand. Not where we normally think it is. It makes us think about marketing differently, selling differently. But wow, we just changed the global market. Well said. Um, Wow, I, I hardly know. I can take this conversation in umpteen different directions, uh, but let, let's go in this direction of technology. Mike, you commented about the role technology played downhole and the benefits that brings. And Joe, you've talked about the consequences of that abundance of supply. And you're uh, obviously Andrew uh, commenting to what the implications are to the global market. If we come onto the surface and we talk about this gas-on-gas -gas competition, Mike, we talk about wind turbines, we talk about um, what does this mean for natural gas uh, and its role in fossil fuels here in North America? It's a, it's a great question because it's such a dynamic scenario now. So if you go back to Joe's comment, you know, about new regulations and things, if you go to that scarcity mentality of, you know, starting with President Carter in the late 70s, okay, um, basically what that implied was a consumer wanting the lights on in a warm house and a hot shower and, you know, refrigerated food and everything, they're going to pay any price for any BTU. And all of a sudden with technology, and we've moved from scarcity to abundance, now there's a choice because you, can, you have a choice of, of BTUs to buy. You may, for if you want mobility, you now have an option to fill your car up with gasoline. I have a natural gas pickup. I can fill my pickup up with natural gas. I have an electric car now. I can fill my car up with kilowatt hours, okay? And those choices, there's a environmental aspect to that choice, okay? And so consumers are now engaging and voting with their purchase of that energy. So, it, and it kind of relates to friend or foe. Um, should renewables and hydrocarbons be friends? And they absolutely should. The, the reality in the market is there, there are many times foes. And because they're competing for that same consumer to purchase it. Now, as, as to, you know, how natural gas in that place to, to wind or solar or whatever, um, wind has clearly changed the dynamics of the gas market. So our parent company, GE, just announced a few years ago the most efficient combined cycle gas turbine. It's 62% thermally efficient. It's almost twice as efficient as a single cycle coal plant. Likely that it's called the H turbine. Um, it's a it's basically a jet engine on the front end. The exhaust off of that engine boils water, drives a steam turbine. It's likely going to go to 65% thermal efficiency. Essentially, minimum criteria pollutants. Uh, it's lowered U.S. carbon emissions overall. This combined cycle gas. It's lowered U.S. carbon emissions by almost 15% over just the last eight years or so. The rest of the world, it exceeds the rest of the world's carbon emission reductions combined, okay? And just at the time the company comes out with this new combined cycle machine, the market has completely collapsed for it. 
And if you've looked at some of the turmoils of, of parent GE, um, they've had to make reductions in, 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 in staffing because of this. And the developed world uh, has kind of lost its appetite for these machines. And, and now they're actually going back to, for example, single cycle machines. Just out here in western Oklahoma City, og &E just put in uh, a bank of combustion turbines instead of combined cycle. It's actually a pretty good move because they're going to buy energy off the grid at the cheapest price they can buy it, and, and, and that's right in Oklahoma. That's wind. And you say, well, the wind doesn't always blow. And, well, the wind blows most of the time here, but the reality is the wind blows all the time somewhere, okay? And those immediate ramp machines out at Mustang can balance that energy system very quickly. I just read last week in Louisiana, utility is installing 128 megawatts of reciprocating engine generation capacity because it's so cheap to buy, the capital expenditure is so low. So the reality is energy is a system and the markets are going to find a way to optimize the balance of that. They should work together. Um, they're finding ways to work together, but they're still competing. And I think to your point, a really good one for the oil and gas industry is we have to move past that consumers will buy any BTU for any price. Literally for years, all we had to do was produce our product and people bought it. And now they have a choice and we have to engage with continuous improvement. We have to lower our environmental footprint. We're going to have to lower our carbon emissions. We're going to have to lower our methane emissions. And the reality is our footprint target, I think we should set it equal to renewables and go compete in the market. And actually, there's tremendous opportunity to do that. Yeah, and I would, the other thing I would add is your company also comes out with bigger and bigger wind turbines every year as well, right? Um, <laughs> so your, the, the, uh, the friend or foe uh, comment, you know, I, I think really you also need to think about it from the perspective of really let's think of it as the OECD countries, the developed world versus the um, emerging markets out there. And, and, and we, we do, we're very fortunate with the lifestyle that we live here in North America and in all OECD countries for that matter. Um, there's seven plus billion people on the planet um, and uh, you know the OECD countries represent about 1.3. Obviously uh, our energy intensity is uh, immense. So friend or foe, here in North America, it's always been, okay, great, we have this wind development and wind, you look at the generation uh, and how generation is performing, gas, coal, nukes, et cetera, um, and uh, wind has had great gains, right? And coal obviously has rolled and every year we're burning less and less coal in this country to the point where, you know, I question, you know, will we burn coal in this country in 10 years or will we burn far less coal than we burn today? Um, so as an example, um, you look at, uh, um, well, let me finish with the global thing. So China, um, I looked this up uh, last night, um, generation, so this is not capacity, this is generation, 65% of their generation is coal, 20% hydro, 3% natural gas, 4% nuke, and 4% wind, and, and then round out the rest with the other. So. One of the things at dinner last night was, was our people, um, w w we talked to the students and I was surprised by the pessimism of uh, people's concern around longevity of oil, of oil and gas careers. Um, and the, 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 this panel, we're supposed to talk about the future hydrocarbons. In my opinion, the future hydrocarbons is bright. Uh, people, young people, there is all sorts of opportunity and career out there, uh, career runway, go for it. Um, but globally, um, you know, there's a huge opportunity in the developing world for gas, natural gas. Here in the U.S., it is a, you, we all know this, we wake up and we drink our coffee from our Yeti cups and we go out there and compete every day, and that's what is happening. And so coal, coal has, has, it's been gas and wind, particularly in the U.S., that have been growing uh, strongly at the expense of coal. And in the same way, in China, India, India, 77% um, of their generation is coal, right? There's a huge opportunity there for gas and wind and solar, right? So I think you need to think really, um, in North America, it is, we are, 
demand is, the easy days of finding demand for hydrocarbons are over, right? Um, this gentleman drives a, a natural gas vehicle, an electric vehicle, and I assume you also have a, an internal or an ICE, an internal combustion engine vehicle as well, right? So very diverse. And a bicycle. And I've a bicycle, okay. And a kayak, and a kayak I learned as well. So yeah, diverse portfolio of transportation there. So, um, so long-winded, long I apologize. So there's this global thing that needs to be thought about. And then secondly, um, as it relates specifically to the gas market and some of the comments that, that um, Mike just made, we are getting in the, in the North American hyper-competitive markets here, um, we are getting to the stage where gas, a lot of gas nominations on pipelines are done on a daily basis. Um, we, and some pipelines, I know uh, Spectra, which is now Enbridge, uh, they have posted nominations on an hourly basis, but some of the things that you mentioned, you're talking about those combustion turbines, and I talked to, we have power developers that we do work with, and, and, and really the opportunity is becoming um, more micro, more short term in the power markets, right? It's not, I, I don't need another 1,000 megawatt combined cycle plant that's going to crank out at 55% utilization. I need, what I need is in this one little tiny node, I need, I need because of the, the, just the way that the grid is evolving and uh, renewables, the intermittency and the disruptiveness of the renewables, it's becoming this more um, very, uh, it's very intense. Uh, I'll remind you, um, um, Joe, you, you were uh, in the cash retail markets in January. We had Algonquin City Gate priced at $155 a megawatt hour and $300. Uh, $350, or sorry, we had uh, uh, $155 per MMBTU was Algonquin CityGate, and New England ISO was at about $300, $350 a megawatt hour January 5th this year, and they were burning 38% uh, uh, oil uh, in, in New England on that day because it was so cold. So, um, but the opportunities are becoming more short term, and, and, and that's a transition that we're seeing. So. No, no one knows better than I about those days when it was cold. <laughs> we had 10 days of mi like minus 10, uh, which is very unusual. Then a week later, it was 72 degrees, by the way. Uh, so things are going on out there. A couple comments. I'm going to pick up a mic. Uh, uh, I wrote something called, uh, years ago called the Energy Company of the 21st Century, where you know, no one's going to actually pay for energy anymore. Uh, I, just, I, lo I love Star Wars. You never saw them pay for any things that refuel their rocket, their, 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 their vehicles. That's happening right now. In Germany, RWE is using cryptocurrencies, blockchain, uh, for people to recharge their electric cars. That is fantastic. You know what that does? It allows them to really know what demand is. They're using big data to how, see how things are working. They can gauge all that really, really well. And not a penny changes hands. They cut out the intermediary. That saves 4 or 5%. They have better efficient planning. It's win-win for everybody. Now that actually, I never saw that coming, I'm not paying, but that's how it's going to happen. But also what's happening right now is we, have, we will have a new clearing mechanism in the marketplace. You, you hit on it. Consumers are going to want cleaner and cleaner energy. How do you get that? Batteries. Batteries are going to be built. They're being built in uh, Australia right now, big ones, to be the, the interface. You provide the battery with power from coal or from gas or from wind or solar, and I, the consumer, with blockchain technology can say, what kind I want to buy? And you will know that at the, at the battery function, and he'll go out and find how that is going to be supplied. Just transparently happening, but collecting big data to play with the demand and supply curve. It's phenomenal what's about to happen for us all out there. It's overwhelming. Yes, indeed, I'm, I'm big on oil and gas. It's, it's not going to go away. It's going it's to change its spots and change its colors. It's part of this game, uh, basically, that, that's going on. Uh, it's all technology-led, without question, powerful. We will be able to buy exactly what we want, seamlessly. Uh, and that brings the cost down. We're providing cheaper and cheaper energy. Go to China, though. Go to India, though. China has the world's largest installed solar, wind, et cetera. They're installing like crazy. It's not very much right now, but it's a dictate. Uh, uh, Saudi Arabia, they have the world's richest solar resources and wind resources. They're about to start installing large-scale solar and wind. Why? So they can sell their oil to us now before they can't sell it to us. Basically, knowing it's stupid to use their oil to burn for, for, uh, for power, uh, they're losing money. The economics are totally different, but the economics are also very good. Uh, go, to, go, to, go right now to Kenya 
in, in places in Africa. A lot of my life has been spent in these countries working with them in my, in my business life and my other life. You can go to places in Africa right now and you can buy your electricity with this phone for your little hut. Uh, you can do you, you're buying solar very often. It's fantastic what's going on. Uh, they are so far advanced in payment systems and buying systems with their phones compared to us, it's overwhelming. Now, we don't need to be in the same way. What they're doing is they're, very, they're avoiding high-cost centralized systems, both data collection and billing systems, but also the building of the large-scale systems. This goes back to the 70s, large versus small appropriate technology. Uh, I'm the one who's most passionate in my own life over the years of trying to help people in these countries out. The company Good Energy is where I was on board of. We built these facilities on our profits in these companies because the family who owned the company, it's family held, believed 20% of all proceeds should go to people in developing countries. A strong ethic. We also made money doing it. So follow up on comment on the not pay anything for energy, and, it, and it's a really good one. Natural gas, renewables. So in renewables, fuel's free, but the conversion cost isn't free. And, but the conversion cost is coming down. And so if you talk to the wind developers, for example, Nextera, big wind developer across the nation, big in Oklahoma, also a huge buyer of natural gas, um, they'll tell you that the cost curve for wind is primarily being driven by competition from natural gas. So they're bidding projects now, and that's still on the federal production tax credit, but they're still they're bidding wholesale electricity prices well under two cents a kilowatt hour. And so if you're a electric purchaser here in, in Oklahoma City, you're probably, if you're paying average with og e you're probably paying uh, just under 10 cents. Um, so you can see this is a really compelling competition thing. Um, but wind is not dispatchable like natural gas is dispatchable. And to your point on microgrids, natural gas is a wonderful thing for stabilizing the grids. And absolutely, it's going to go to those micro points to stabilize the grid. I think your point in differentiating the developed world from the developing world is a really important one. And if you look at BP or Exxon or any of the big international oil company studies, they'll tell you that uh, energy intensity, uh, you know, units of energy per unit of GDP, that's, that's going down in the developed world. It's going to continue to go down. Uh, we're probably on a permanent decline in consumption of oil, for example, for powering vehicles just because of Fuel efficiency, tremendous opportunities are still there for that. Uh, but the developing world's a very different place. And if combined cycle gas is, you know, uh, challenged or with headwinds in the developed world, um, it could be a tremendous opportunity, especially in Asia. There's challenges to make it happen. But if you're now the president in, in China, who's now going to be the president for life, um, if you don't address the air quality issues in Beijing and Shanghai, you, you could have a, an Arab Spring in China, and, and that would not be a good thing. So they have to do this, and, and they have to find ways to do that. Now, take a little bit more tangible example to that billion people around the world who really don't have modern energy, and, and it's cooking fuels. And they cook with charcoal or coal or dung or something in closed buildings, and a, and a really interesting statistic I heard is the deaths from particulate matter ingestion from unclean cooking fuels exceed the deaths from malaria, tuberculosis, and AIDS combined. And the funding for AIDS, tuberculosis, and malaria is about 10 times the funding for improved cooking fuels. So if you just did, for example, small canisters of compressed gas or LPG, you could dramatically improve health consequences. But you have a, a distribution system. So it's a differentiated energy system. Say the US where we have this extraordinary pipeline system and local distribution system, there you'd have to have small canisters. Actually, the people there, the consumers, are, are in such a poverty-stricken condition, they can't even afford to buy a whole canister of gas. So now they have a, a scenario where they can actually dole out the amount of gas they need on that day and pay for it. But it's a whole different radical disruption in the system, but it could be an extraordinary 
uh, improvement of the quality of life, you know, to use natural gas around the world. But the, it, the, there's so many dynamics. It's so exciting. Um, and then I'll just, you know, kind of kind of close on your comment about sort of whether a young person should be pessimistic or optimistic. Um, we're going to use fossil fuels for a long time. Um, they may plateau, but the reality is standard of living is directly correlated to energy consumption, and the world's going to probably add 2 billion people. They're going to need more energy. A tremendous portion of that energy is going to come from renewables, but it's still going to take all the fossil we can, and just fighting the decline curve alone is, is a big challenge, so there's still a lot of opportunity there. Well said. And, you know, those two billion people deserve the right to join the middle class. And to do so, we've learned that energy is required to get there. And so all of this is really well said. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to switch gears just a little bit. Um, I, I can't help but notice Ben Chow is in the audience, and we're talking about these flow characteristics and technology and shales and unconventional resources, and, and, and none of our current physics really tells us how things should flow. That was Mike's point earlier. Um, and I want to reiterate, since I'm the dean of the College of Earth and Energy, it's nice to hear that petroleum engineers got a job for some time from our distinguished panels, because that's what we do is put out the best and the brightest. But what I will tell you that um, there are so many unanswered questions, unanswered questions in technology below ground, and frankly, unanswered questions about how big data. And I, I'm curious what the panel thinks. What is the most, in your mind, what is the most prominent, most impactful, unanswered question? that we could, if we were to solve, it would kind of change the whole dynamic of fossil fuels. This time I'm going to go last. Okay. <laughs> Who wants it? I stumped the panel. Well, let, let's start with the footprint part of fossil fuels and the, and the development. So um, development of shales now completely revolutionized energy supply. Um, we, we no longer just search for discrete traps. We go straight to the source rock, whole different technology challenge. And, and so what does that involve? So it, it involves uh, water. It involves sand, okay? Um, and let's just let's start with water, and, and let's, let's look at the Permian, okay? The Permian isn't, you know, Appalachia where it rains a lot. Okay, it's it's pretty arid out there, and it, and 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 take an example of northern Oklahoma, uh, you know, in the Mississippian play with water disposal, and the seismicity that came from that. Um, so you know, Commissioner Anthony Cena over here, he's had to live this. Um, they've done a tremendous job of saying, okay, what is happening to cause induced seismicity, and what do we need to do to reduce it? And I think the latest numbers, it's down about two-thirds um, from a very aggressive and engaged program to deal with water disposal. So take that same case to the Permian. They basically dispose of their water in the same zone. We call it the Arbuckle in northern Oklahoma. In the Permian, they call it the Ellenberger. But it's actually more constrained than the Permian of, of where you can – it's thinner. Um, and if you actually look at the daily earthquake maps, which some of us do, um, you're starting to see seismic events in the western side of the Permian, the, the Delaware Basin. And if you look at the ramp up and, and looking at several million barrels a day, maybe four or five million barrels a day of potential incremental production coming from the Permian, they're going to have a, a, an enormous water management, where you source the water, how you reuse the water, what you do with your when you're done with it, uh, whether you're using potable water and, and just the concept of sustainability, the old-fashioned way of taking completely fresh water, good for people, cows, and crops, putting things in it, using it one time, and then permanently disposing of it, that's, that's a non-starter for us. So we have to go to reuse. We have to use water that's not good for people, cows, and crops. Um, so the Permian's, you know, that's, that's a, an enormous challenge to the industry in addition, you know, to, to the sand issue. And so, you know, there's, there's folks that, that think the Permian, um, five million barrels a day may be a stretch out there. Um, 
And, and then you look at some of the other big shale plays. We were in Sierra Week last week. Mark Papa, founder of EOG. Now, again, to your point, people kind of play to their own book, but he's a pure play Permian player now, but did a tremendous job at EOG. Um, he says the sweet spots in the Eagle Ford and the Bakken uh, are starting to be fully developed, which means you're going to have to start going to Tier 2 locations, which puts more emphasis on the Permian. Um, and with the constraints I just mentioned, um, and, and you look at, like, the Bureau of Economic Geology at uh, that other university south of the Red River, um, basically they're, they're saying there could be a million undrilled locations in the Permian. Start thinking of the logistics of that, okay? And then you look at the social license to operate. Now, West Texas is not highly populated, but the rest of these big plays coming on, like the Utica Marcellus, People live there, and so there's got to be a coexistence. So impact, operations, logistics, water, um, those, are, those are things that have to be addressed for fossil fuel to have the sustainability that the world needs. Andrew, is there a burning unanswered question for you? So we do a lot of work for um, um, producers and private equity and you know the question we get a lot is recovery rates um, you know what what are they and how can they change and then also where are we on the curve of produ what we call producer efficiency right and what has happened here in North America in the last 15 20 years is amazing right um, a lot of us worked in the industry when we were running out of gas then we went through the building of all the regas terminals in 2000 through 2005 that of course never got used um, so in terms of, um, you know, recovery rate and producer efficiency, in talking to active producers, um, and you talked about your, your old drilling rigs that are now in museums, uh, you know, active producers now are very excited about the robotic element of, of the, the drilling rig and, and the um, amount of big data and technology that is there. The question is, is you know, are, have we, are we 80% of the way there in terms of efficiency? Um, just under the current construct of the way, um, you know, horizontal drilling and multi-stage fracking, are we 80% of the way there? And, of course, betting against technology, we have learned, is a dangerous thing. Um, and um, if we somehow are on the verge, you know, of the great shale revolution that's occurred in the last 15 years, if we're 80 percent, 90 percent of the way there, and I talk to some producers who do say that, they say, you know, we think we really are, there's not a lot more that we can wring out of the system in terms of efficiency. However, if we're on the verge of, um, I don't know, laser drilling or something far-fetched like that, right, or, or some way to become even more efficient, or we, we come up with a technology that enhances recovery by 2x, 3x, um, it, it's a whole... It, it's another game changer, right? So is the game changer, is there another game changer that is out there? Is there another Mitchell Energy out there that um, is uh, is going to figure out a game changer on the production side? So that's something that we wonder about too. Of course, it's a double-edged sword on technology because, and we've talked about it today in this panel, um, technology is playing an amazing role on the demand side. We are getting more and more efficient uh, with on the demand side and therefore, it's harder to come up with that those easy gains on demand. So, but I think brief answer is the the recovery and, and technology, uh, and, and those are, um, if in fact we are 80 percent of the way there, and we have found all the great rock in North America, right? So there is the, you know, I speak out in California at times, and uh, people will ask, hey, what about the Monterey shale? You know, are we going to start producing the Monterey shale? Uh, um, you know, have we found all the great rock in North America, unconventional rock, and we tend to think that, yes, we have found it. We had five years of $100 oil. We had, um, in those same five years, a very decent gas pricing. And there are times where we saw rigs uh, in the Everglades of Florida. We saw a rig in Idaho, in eastern Washington. I don't think of eastern Washington state as an oil province or a gas province. Um, and, of course, people were just playing games, and you could do that at $100 oil. Um, so, it, again, if recoveries if there's an, another a great um, quantum shift out there on the, on the supply side, 
um, boy, it's what that does to cost. Uh, and, and we're already living in a world of where Henry seems pretty happy at about 275 right now, and crude is um, pretty happy at $60. And I think a lot of producers are happy on the oil side at a $60 crude, 275 doesn't last long, um, especially with 50, 75 cent basis differentials in the supply areas. Yes, there are wells that work at, at, at $2, some wells, but on average, most plays don't work uh, at those kind of costs and, and price levels. So, uh, I'm going to take a very different approach to the question, if I can remember the question. <laughs> uh, mine deals with price institute, uh, which is education. What I was struck by last night with dinner with the, some of these students who are wonderful young people who have great futures, and they really do, was the worry about they're not going to have a job in five or ten years. To me, that says, why do they feel that way? Uh, they're in a terrific program that should be making them flexibly, uh, possibly em employees down the road. They have a skill set, yes, but how do you learn and uh, develop and adapt through your career so you're ready for the next stage, whatever it happens to be? Uh, that's robotics, that's AI, that's big data. That should all be part of the curriculum, but maybe be applied to petroleum engineering, but then you apply it elsewhere. It's, it's the human, to me, it's the human resource issue. As I know I'm looking at a man back there who knows more about it than I do. We're speaking in the next panel. You know, where are the people who can build the next nuclear power plants in this country? We're not training them. We're not educating them. But do they have to be trained specifically in that? Yes, some of them do, absolutely. But how do you build that plant? That's not necessarily the nuclear engineer. But how do you become adaptable and flexible as that employee? It's education. But also, it's something we have here in this country that many countries don't have, but more and more are getting it. It's even happening in China a little bit, what I call the crazy uh, entrepreneur uh, spirit, crazy technology entrepreneur, people who believe the passion what they're working on and it can solve the world's problems. What I am inspired by the, this younger generation, and that's my kids, uh, you know, under 30, who have a passion for what they're doing that can help solve, make a better world. They all feel that way. It's fantastic. And when you have a passion around technology, you're going to drive it and make it work. It happens here quite dramatically because of pri private property rights. You mentioned Mitchell Energy. What made that work? It was George Mitchell, who was a spectacular ti titan of the field. I happened to be lucky enough to work with him and know him. He realized he was sitting in a bank account down there, but he had to have the key for it. It was like Harry Potter taking that thing down to the bottom and getting into your, your vault. He said, God, I have to get into my vault somehow. That's called, you know, private property. That's mine. How do I get at it? It made him innovate with some technology we knew existed. They put them together and bang, there we are. I see that happening all over the place. Some will win and some will lose. But that spirit's strong. Uh, batteries, I, I'm involved with a company, lithium ion battery company. It makes the cathode material, okay? Uh, it's, it's two young, crazy Chinese-American scientists who have a different, same three materials everyone else uses, plus three other little things, which I can't even pronounce the words because I've seen, I've seen the formula. I don't even know what the hell it means. But guess what it does st stage one? It doubles the uh, efficiency, doubles the number of charges you can do at half the price. That's today. They're building that plant in China right now. Uh, they have unlimited, people are demanding this like crazy, we can't build a factory fast enough, but the next one will double that power again in lowering the price. This is happening everywhere. It's happening on the demand side too, everywhere. There's an aerogel technology, it was, designed, it was first developed for NASA. A lot of companies have been formed to produce aerogel technologies. I'm involved with one that makes a board out of aerogel. The board is that thick. If I can make a piece four by eight, I can hold it in my hand, it's so light, it's pure vacuum. The heat and cold can't get through there. Cannot get through there. It's, uh, it's an A50. Most installation in buildings and houses is two or four R factor. This is five zero. That's four at orders of magnitude. Uh, it's unbelievable. It's happening everywhere. It's a matter of letting those folks run. Let that penetrate. Uh, somehow assist in the implementation. So it cycles faster and faster, like Microsoft. We all started with Microsoft One. Where are we now? I think I'm still at seven or 10, because a new one I don't like. But anyway, each, each new Microsoft version happened more and more quickly. That's what's happening to every single technology on the supply side and the demand side. It's going to be really powerful. It takes a while to get going. But once it gets going, it's powerful. So I say education is the key, so everyone's prepared for that transition in their lives with the basic knowledge they have and how to keep 
bringing that to speed, going to the next stage uh, through the professional life and through the educational life, to keep going with it so they're ahead of the game. Be ready for the move, and they're going to be happening. So I say education. Well said. So um, let me take this just a slightly different direction. I, I mean, one of the things we talked about in technology, and we, t we have a tendency to point at a technology and say that was the breakthrough, you know. It was completions technology and unconventional shales. The truth is, um, it's a combination of technologies. It's an, an enormous combination. It's you know horizontal drilling, it's steering, it's imaging, where we know how to do things better. On the demand side management, my wife and I just spent, frankly, an enormous amount of money making our house smart. The good news is, the house is very smart, but we can't turn on the lights. Um, <laughs> the but but the reality is, it's efficient and it's and it's it's reducing. The, the demand that we have to have the same lifestyle we had before, only in a way that's much more efficient. I, 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 can't, I may get the statistic wrong, but at the CIRA conference, someone quoted this. I was amazed. I think they were talking about emissions in the U.K., and they said that the emissions in the U.K. have now returned to levels of 1890, not 1980, 1890. Okay, so there is in these developing countries this move away from coal into natural gas into basically climate friendlier fuels. Okay, uh, and it's having a huge impact. I think those of you who aren't aware of the Kyoto Protocol, and this is the direction I'm going to take the panel now. I'm going to the social license. Um, this country, the United States, outperformed every signator, signatory on the Kyoto Protocol. We didn't sign. But our conversion from coal to gas resulted in a reduction in emissions. And you have to ask yourself, why? Did it happen public policy? No. It happened because of the abundance of natural gas, which made it economically affordable, and ultimately the, the market responded. So now the question is, we talked last night about nuclear losing its social license in the U.S. What is it in our business, what are we at risk of losing our social license, and are we at risk? Mike? So uh, we didn't sign Kyoto for, for good reason, okay? We didn't pass Waxman-Markey for good reason, okay? We're now in a sort of a, a crazy place with regard to the Paris Accord, okay? The clean power plan's on hold. Um, I'll, I'll take it a little different direction than just purely carbon, and let's talk about criteria pollutants and, and clean air. And the Clean Air Act um, was not a, either the original version of the Clean Air Act or the amended version of the Clean Air Act. Both were signed into law by Republican administrations. And when I was working for the governor, uh, we were working on the issue of regional haze in Oklahoma, which was ironically being caused by coal plants in Texas. Um, with the prevailing winds, but if you focus on clean air and criteria pollutants, actually a crazy thing happens and carbon emissions go down dramatically just by quality of life, okay? And, and in this instance, um, we negotiated a settlement on regional haze. A couple of Carter era coal plants were shut down. Some of those were converted to natural gas. Um, as many of you followed, and Commissioner Anthony was in, in, in right in the middle of this, but there was a very large coal plant proposed in northeast Oklahoma that was not built. That power instead went to the Redbud plant at Luther. Um, and some of the economic projections of that now say there's, there's no way that you could ever uh, capture the benefits of what's happened by that power coming from Redbud instead of having gone to a larger coal plant. Um, the, the air quality has driven it now where Oklahoma, in fact, whether the clean power plant goes through or not, the state of Oklahoma would be in compliance with the clean power plant without ever having even tried to address it just because we focused on our resources here, which our wind and natural gas and energy efficiency, okay? And I think around the country, um, that's an, an area that's probably not gotten its due is how much of a role the Clean Air Act has played. And if you just look at air quality in the United States versus China, and I mentioned, you know, their, their 
air quality problems there. Um, the very worst day in the United States is better than the average day in China. And in fact, just walking through the streets of Beijing at, at its worst, and it's and it's and it has improved a little bit. Uh, they're they're getting rid of some like very inefficient like localized coal burning and things like that. Um, but it was like smoking a pack or two of cigarettes per day. And so I think in the U.S. Um, there are economic ways to drive down our carbon emissions. And I think one of the things we haven't done, and I th and I, I know you know we will have DOE here today. But historically, one of the things that I think's been misguided uh, from Washington politics is they went straight to the highest cost things. And if you actually do a marginal cost curve of how you would reduce carbon emissions, it would start with energy efficiency. It actually has a net negative cost. That means it pays you to do it. Okay, You should go to the that first and then the next one next and the next one next and not go straight to the most expensive because it has to be affordable, you know, in, in how we look at it. And I think that's the beauty of what's happened in the United States to drive carbon emissions down 15 percent. And in 2003, plus or minus, you saw natural gas prices of 15 or 18 dollars. And in February of 2016, you saw natural gas prices of $1.60. It's almost a 90 percent reduction, okay? I exactly your point. Here, here we are, we have reduced carbon footprint, we've dramatically improved air, we have incredibly lower energy prices for consumers to the point that we're having to export 10 BCF a day just to keep the ba markets balanced. It's a, it's a pretty neat story. Yeah, so social license, this, we could do a whole nother panel on this one. Um, and there, so I, I've done a lot of work in helping Appalachian producers understand where they can take their gas. Um, and I started covering Appalachia. Um, Joe, I haven't been in the industry as long as you have, um, but uh, it's uh, uh, since 2008. Uh, in, and in 2008, Appalachia produced about 1.6 BCF a day. Today, we produce about 27 BCF a day out of Appalachia. So Ohio, Pennsylvania, West Virginia primarily. Um, there are parts of this country where, um, in the court of public opinion, fossil fuels has slipped badly. Um, and we have lost certain states, states that, um, you know, so let's talk about them, New England. Uh, and, and even sliding down into, and it's, it's, it's expanded too. So New England and California are always bastions for this, but then there are, um, it's expanded up to Oregon and Washington. It's expanded to isolated spots, Austin, Texas, Boulder, Colorado, Madison, Wisconsin. Um, and we have lost those geographies um, and our ability to develop infrastructure. Um, so the state governors, Governor Cuomo, um, Cuomo has canceled multiple um, natural gas pipeline projects that would have taken gas into New York and then on into New England. Um, and, and I told you about the $155 uh, cash price, MMBTU ga cash price for natural gas this winter. And obviously that's because we can't build. Uh, we've tried, uh, Spectra tried, um, Kinder Morgan's tried. Um, but then Constitution Pipeline is a great example and we call it the Wall of Cuomo. Um, and the Wall of Cuomo is the state um, has to enforce Clean Air, Clean Water Acts, which are federal rules. These pipelines get their FERC permits. They go through the FERC process. They have federal um, mandate to proceed. And then the governor's, uh, Governor Cuomo, will then hold it up with a water, a key water permit. Um, and he's done this multiple times for multiple pipelines. Uh, and now we have a new governor in New Jersey, Governor Murphy, who uh, is very outspoken as well. Um, and so, uh, and there are several pipelines. One particular pipeline, Penn East, is a pipeline that's proposed one BCF a day. It's supposed to uh, start construction here very soon and be in service in the next year or two. Um, and we have concerns about that pipeline being uh, able to uh, be constructed. And um, there are producers, again, Joe, that want to do what we call producer push. So they want to push their gas from Appalachia down into New Jersey to find and find new markets and displace gas back into other areas. And they're not, if, if Penn East does not go because Governor Murphy feels he has his constituents' uh, best interest because they have communicated that to him, 
um, then that pipeline will not be built. And so um, there are many, many states where we um, winter comes and goes and you have very low natural gas pricing. But um, Cal And California is the same way. I mean, look at the Permian. The Permian has two pipelines out of it, Transwestern and El Paso. And we have more natural gas than we know what to do with in the Permian at this point. And yet Transwestern El Paso, there is capacity to move gas to California, but California does not have the demand to pull volumes from the Permian at very low prices to California. And so you have open capacity on a pipeline, and yet the gas will not move, even though there um, is an economic spread there, which would say that it should. So we are effectively what we call demand constrained at that point, right? So. Um, and that's one of the challenges in the North American market is demand constraint. But back to the social license, there's a lot of work. Um, I feel like we, in 2005 through 2010, the gas market, Aubrey McClendon got together with the Sierra Club. There was a very good message during that period. Um, and then, the, the, I hate to mention the word, but Gasland came out, the movie, in 2010. And that was a bad day for the fossil fuel industry. But at the same time, uh, unconventional oil in 2010 started to really take traction, um, and crude by rail volume started to increase. We had some crude by rail accidents, um, some horrible ones, um, and these things kind of, and then also I think moving a lot of production to Appalachia and having a lot of production occur in states closer to northeast populations, it kind of shifted the perception of fossil fuels. And now gas really gets characterized as, oh, it's a dirty fossil fuel, when in fact, Many of us here in the room, I think, would argue that gas is a wonderful resource with very low emissions and all sorts of benefits. So there's a lot of public perception work that, that still needs to be done uh, in, in this vein. I think you've hit the key term, public perception. Uh, we can talk all day long, and it's hard to overcome history. However correct or incorrect that history is. Uh, we talked about nuclear last night. Uh, and, you know, my generation has been terribly soiled uh, by the story of nuclear, nuclear going back to Three Mile Island. Uh, you can, it's hard to reverse that. Whatever you do is hard to reverse. I worked in the late 1970s in the UK with the uh, you know, National Coal Board, National Electricity Board, with a man named Walker Sisler from Detroit who was a pioneer of nuclear power in this country, unbelievable individual, lovely people. They couldn't get their message across basically couldn't get the message across. That's why I started off earlier on saying, change it and become a technology company. Tell people what you're doing through technology. Everyone, everyone loves technology. Uh, how do we overcome that black eye? I don't have the answer. It goes back to Rockefeller, folks. It doesn't start with shale. It doesn't start with that. It goes back to Rockefeller. Uh, and that's really hard to get over in this country. It's, it's embedded in our culture. They're you know, it's a bad guy. Uh, and he was screwing the, you know, the consumer and screwing the other producers, pardon my language. How do we overcome that perception problem? I don't have the answer. I've been struggling with that for years and years and years. Because again, most of the people I deal with in this sector, most of you care about the environment. You care about for your children, your grandchildren. You live by the grandfather and grandparent principle. But you know, you're, we, we talk to ourselves too much. We aren't out there talking to the community. Everyone who works for an oil and gas company should be working in their local community, local schools. It's, it's the same to the people, your child is in class with my child. I work in the industry. I'm a good person. I have good values. No one sees that. No one feels that. They just think, oh, we're out to make money. Uh, we're out to screw you. Well, we're giving them lower prices. What else can we do at the end of the day? We're doing it more environmentally efficiently. They're not hearing that message. Uh, how do we change public perception that goes back in this country to 1880, 1890? I certainly don't have the answer. But we have to really begin to change who we are in the public's eyes. Become technology companies. Show that you're doing unbelievable things with science and technology, more than any other industry in the world is doing, even with the Jeff Bezos, et cetera. And we're just beginning to apply big data and quantum computing which is unbelievable powerful for all of us. It's going to lower prices again for us, make everything more efficient and more sustainable. Somehow we have to change that imaging, and that started with uh, Aubrey, uh, and unfortunately it, it took its uh, course the way it did, unfortunately, and we didn't pick up on that. Uh, we didn't keep driving it, but it has to be done one by one in your community, uh, and it's hard to overcome. But if you go out and talk to people in those schools, they get it. Not here, go out to Ohio, where I'm from. I talk about it there. Western PA, where you know, my parents were from. Uh, they understand. 
there's the, the, the two work together. They're, they're not competitors. They're, they're, they have to they coordinate and they compete. Okay, and that's how the oil business has always been. You coordinate and you compete. Same with renewables. Coordinate and compete. Same with the environment. You coordinate and you compete. It makes everything better for the world. Changing perception. I don't know anyone in the PR business has figured it out yet, but we have to figure that out because we're good people and we care. Well said. You know, the history is so important. I teach Introduction to Petroleum Engineering at the University of Oklahoma, and I, I make it mandatory that everybody read the prize because when you read the prize, you, you start to see history repeating itself, you know, whether it be Rockefeller and the antitrust, which gets tattooed to the oil and gas industry as a, as a whole, uh, Secretary Fall, who corruptly marketed, uh, you know, uh, uh, U.S. resources. Uh, some of this stuff is still sticking around. It's still, it's still tied to us. And so we have to work hard to change that perception. I was in the oil and gas business for 35 years. I've never met more environmentally friendly, more conscientious workers than the people I had the opportunity to work with. I know Bruce Stover had the same experience. We all have had a similar experience. So we do have, we do have a problem with the social license, and it's not something we can deny. I'm like you, Joe, I'm not sure I have the answer, but I know that it, it, it comes from repeated conversations. Um, I'm getting ready to open it up to the audience for questions. I think it's really important that you get the opportunity to ask this distinguished panel something that might be in, interesting to you. Uh, before I, while you're thinking about that, so get ready to raise your hand, okay. Uh, I'll just ask one more question of Mike. Uh, buy some time here for the audience to get warmed up. Um, of all the things you talked about, water, uh, climate, uh, access that Andrew talked about. What, what things, what, what one bothers you the most? Which one worries you the most with, with regard to losing our social license? You know, I, I think for me, it's probably the water and seismicity issue. And you take a red state, credibly supportive of the oil and gas industry, and Look at all the other obstacles we've we've overcome or whatever. Nobody likes it when the ground shakes, okay? And you know, water's the essence of life, and we're we're gonna have to we're gonna have to get around this one. You know, kudos to the commission on what we've done in the Mississippi and and and, and reducing that. Um, but now we're seeing other activity. We're we're starting to see some seismic events from hydraulic fracturing. And understand that the scale of industrial activity for the industry term, a, a wine rack, but the wine rack is multiple horizontals stacked vertically, so say eight across, eight deep. And when you start looking at, that'd be, you know, in one given section, roughly 5,000 foot of lateral, um, at 2,500 pounds of propent per, per foot, you multiply that times eight times eight, and all of a sudden you get into extraordinarily big numbers, and it changes the stress of the ground, and, and you know, we're not a plate boundary state, but little faults get triggered, and so it's going to require some sophistication there, and things are never quite as good as they seem, and they're also never quite as bad as they seem, but black swans come up, um, and I don't I don't want to see a black swan there, and I know there's a lot of great companies doing great work to to overcome this, um, but that one worries me, and, and we need to work hard at it. And to Joe's point, education is the key. We're going to have this science solution for these problems. We're going to have to get smarter and better at what we do. Uh, questions from the audience. Uh, if you wouldn't mind, wait for Adam or someone to bring you a microphone, but I'm looking for a hand. Anybody got a burning question for our panel? Right here in the middle. Uh, Adam, can, or, or someone, can you bring this gentleman a microphone? We're doing a live webcast, and we want everyone to be able to hear your, hear your question. You guys are promoting uh, battery power and things like that. I'm curious what country controls or owns the largest uh, raw materials to make batteries? Uh, there are a few, <laughs> uh, some in South America, some in Africa. Uh, uh, lithium is key, so is, uh, I forget what the hell they are, Co cobalt. Uh, I don't think we have a real supply issue. People worry about it right now. We don't have a supply issue. The biggest battery producers in the world, by the way, are in China. 
uh, the single biggest ones are in China, and they're growing really, really fast. But there's no, there's no raw material problem. There will always be cycles with it, but there's no real problem, basically. And most of them are, right now, you know, they're, they're uh, development-friendly uh, countries, basically, with mostly U.S. companies operating there, by, by the way. Uh, Andrew, I, th I think you said a while ago that you didn't think that $2.75 gas was sustainable. Um, we're obviously in a prolonged period of oversupply of natural gas. Do you see that it's possible that the growth in LNG will change the uh, dynamic uh, to a point where sometime in the foreseeable future we, ne we may be in a more balanced situation where we're not chronically oversupplied? Yeah, so your question then begs the question, how much LNG development do we get? And Sharif Suki, there is this round two of projects that are going for FID now, right? So I mentioned the six projects that will get us to roughly six BCF a day. Um, and then the question is, there's a bunch of projects that are being proposed by a bunch of people that have been in the industry and are now reformulated. Um, Tellur or Tellurian is one. Next, day, next decade is another. There's a, there's a handful of them. So, the question becomes: We have this big growth in production volume coming between now and 2019, um, and we need that to meet uh, a lot of the LNG export that that incremental, um, call it five six BCF a day of export that's going to come to the market by, by 2019. Um, and it also goes back to my question about uh, are we 80% of the way there on producer efficiency? If we have found all the great rock in America and if um, technology on the supply side stays relatively stable, those are big ifs, you know, our belief is long term uh, we do move through this resource. We are back in a resource depletion model um, and you do move up the cost curve over time. However, that is, does not mean, I think, that we're returning to an $8 natural gas market anytime soon in the next 10 to even 15 years. Um, but you could see, and we do expect to see, and, and part of Sarah Week last week, there was a lot of talk about sweet spots and sweet spot, sweet spot depletion. Range Resources talked about it in their earnings calls uh, this past quarter. Um, and if that does occur, then we will move up the cost curve. This market can handle an incremental, um, let's say we do go to 10 Bs. I could see it going to 12, 13, 14, perhaps 15 BCF a day. I don't see it going much higher than that. And ultimately, how long we're able to carry that, um, it, you, start to, you do start to move up the cost curve. It moves towards, in a 10 to 20 year period, we believe we're still in a five, six dollar gas market, not in, there's just a lot of resource, right? The Barnett, there are shale um, naysayers who say, oh, the Barnett is, it's done. Well, the Barnett's not done. There's plenty of resource left in the Barnett, Fayette, Fayetteville too. It's just, it's not economic to produce there. And, and we've moved to the Marcellus and the Haynesville and the Bakken and uh, DJ and, and Permian, right? So um, the Barnett will get its day. It's just, it's probably 10 to 20 years from now. So there's a lot of resource that comes out of the, out of the weeds at, at four and five dollars um, and a lot of things that are economic. Um, but uh, at, at, at $2.75, we will move from there, uh, we believe, uh, in the next several years. Can I add a quick comment, though? That's the United States. Yes. That's the United States. Uh, Russia has a lot more gas, folks. Now, they're not a very desirable partner right now, but you can't deny their resource base. And that's both pipeline and LNG. Huge mega fields. We're not talking about shale, mega fields. We're also talking about uh, uh, Kurdistan, huge resources. I just say this because price will be determined by the global market. There's a lot of supply out there in the global market, so all I want to add. Yeah, Australia is a, an example that comes to mind. I mean, yeah. there's, we got gas on gas competition when the LNG becomes exportable, and, and I think we underestimate that. I think what's the global LNG market right now, 29 BCF a day? I, I'm a little old in my data. But, I mean, if you're taking 8 BCF a day into a 30 BCF a day market, you're taking a major step forward. And so you do have to compete, uh, and that's going to be an interesting uh, answer. I would, I would temper a little. If you just look at supply fundamentals, and, and right now the market 
is oversupplied a lot due to associated gas from the oil development. If there are potentially obstacles on how far the oil play could go, um, I, I don't feel the same obstacles on the dry gas side. There's tens of not hundreds of thousands of incredibly prolific dry gas locations in the U.S., not even accounting for these immense conventional fields in, in Russia and other places. Just some of the recent completions in the Haynesville, you're, you're seeing completion rates of 15, almost 100 million cubic feet a day. Put that in perspective, one well at 90 million a day powers a 500 megawatt ga combined cycle gas plant. So one well provides electricity for 500,000 people. So, you know, I, I see, uh, especially with competition from renewables and other things, it's going to be around cost driving profitability, not price. And so as a company, we're actually looking at ways where you increase yield at lower cost with permission. But the market, as you say, is going to drive the price and the oil and gas industry has never not responded, and they're going to respond again. And I think there can be, it can be a very uh, lucrative natural gas market, even if prices remain moderate. And it's all you know to the benefit of consumers. Just you know, the way I think about it is, it's, okay. it's, it's BT equivalency plus a slight premium from gas because of the climate impact. Uh, and that would be, what, 360, something along those lines. Um, and so when you think about the global market, you end up really having to decide, can you compete at their alternative supply? And the global market can be oversupplied very quickly. This is a volatile um, supply and demand picture. Next I've question. got a question on the oil oil side. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we talked about, we've kind of maybe found all the good rock and and uh, getting close to developing those with well bores. But we haven't talked about the thing we went through that I went through in my career on the on the conventional reservoir side, which is enhanced recovery. Uh, what What's your view of enhanced oil recovery? You've got the wells there. They exist. You don't have to drill another well. You just have to put in the infrastructure to proce process the hydrocarbons out of the rock. The recovery factor has got to be extremely low. Uh, could you comment on the potential for EOR in, uh, in the shale plays that we've developed in this country? Yeah, so Bruce, it's a great question, and, and I'll start on EOR and conventional rock first. Um, I'm a huge advocate of CO2 enhanced oil recovery. I think if there's a viable place to actually sequester carbon, it's in depleted pore volume. And oh, by the way, it actually allows the markets to participate in wealth creation, which would be differentiated from carbon sequestration in brine aquifers. And so if you all haven't followed it, the, there was the Tax Reform Act last fall, and then just a few weeks ago there was a Tax Extender Act, and as part of that Tax Extender Act, there was a little provision, be imperceptible to most people, 45Q, which allows for a price per ton of carbon for anthropogenic CO2, that would be from like industrial CO2, um, you get a uh, a credit for putting that in the ground for enhanced oil recovery. We see a tremendous opportunity here. Um, the United States injects right now about 60 million tons a year of CO2, primarily in the Permian, and that CO2 is all sourced from natural CO2 domes. And it, at SARA last week, Vicki Holub with Occidental, the 800-pound gorilla in, in the enhanced oil recovery market with CO2, had said a pipeline from Houston to the Permian for CO2 would be a game changer. Ironically, in 2010, I wrote a framing paper for a joint MIT-BEG event in Cambridge, and we called it the Horseshoe Pipeline, but that pipe from the industrial complex of the Gulf Coast to the Permian would be an incredible game changer. CO2 is a magical fluid in the oil field. It you can hydraulically fracture with it. It has the characteristics of water and the density of water to pump it, but it flows back like a gas. In an enhanced oil re recovery mode, it acts like a solvent, like a thinner of oil. It reduces its viscosity, which makes the oil flow better, and it energizes the fluid just like 
it does in your soda when you pop the top. Um, but it, it's an incredible opportunity. Um, and the CO2 potential with, there's a group in, in DC, Velo Kuskers Group, Advanced Resources International, they did a very detailed study of the potential in the United States and just coming to Oklahoma here. The CO2 enhanced oil recovery potential of Oklahoma with identified fields with the right characteristics would equal all the oil that's ever been produced in the state's history. It's a staggering number and it's a tremendous opportunity and this 45Q thing will help us push it along. What we have to do is we have to develop the carbon capture technologies. Most of our research budget has been to capture carbon from coal-fired plants, which is tremendously challenging. First of all, that emission comes out of, at atmospheric pressure, so most of the parasitic energy load is required to pressurize that CO2. So right there, that's a 25 to 30 percent parasitic load. Aside from the fact that you get a pretty good constituency of the periodic table of the elements in that emission, which makes it more complicated, a different path is capturing carbon off natural gas combustion, which is more challenging because the concentrations aren't as high. Um, but this is a tremendous area of opportunity. So I would say just starting with conventional reservoirs is a great place. And then if you follow the literature on the tight rock, which is not really amenable to flooding, uh, but you're seeing EOG and others in the literature, they're doing essentially stranded gas where they take gas that doesn't have a market and they re-inject it back into the reservoir. And it's, it's really showing a lot of promise. Th this, is a, this is a wide open field on the recovery factor issue. Great answer. Uh, Henry, you get the last question. Thank you, Mike. Um, so the panel seemed unanimous that fossil fuels and renewables are compatible and, and sharing market share. Given that, um, why do you think we haven't seen the major oil companies and large independents uh, investing in renewables becoming agnostic about the fuel they sell and rebranding themselves as energy providers as opposed to just oil and gas producers? Uh, let me just start. Uh, one company did that back in the 90s called BP, uh, led by uh, now Lord Brown. Uh, and we discussed this last night. John was almost thrown out of the industry when he endorsed the climate change is happening and rebranded BP beyond petroleum. Uh, BP was one of the biggest players in the world solar industry. BP was a big player in uh, domestic cooking in uh, India and Africa where they were taking and making, spe they were giving away special stoves so that they could sell into these pellets they were producing to make it clear in those households. They were huge in this. Sold it all off. You'll hear when uh, the, uh, the man from BP speaks, they're back in the business. Uh, Total's big in this business, by the way. I don't see if you follow Total, but they're very big uh, in solar and a lot of these new technologies. Nowhere near the budgets of the oil and gas, but they're, they committed a lot of their brand to it. Total has the way BP did in the 90s. Total's picked it up uh, and moving hard on it. Small scale still, but they're moving into it because they don't want to make mistakes because they actually invested in a big solar company at the peak of its price and a month later it collapsed to the core of its price. <laughs> Bad timing, unfortunately. Uh, but they want to make sure they understand the business that they're going into, not just investing in a whole hog because you cannot transfer immediately an oil and gas executive into the solar business or into the wind business or even into the shale business, basically. It's, it's different skills being used as a transformation. But some of these folks, those two in particular, BP and Total, I know are working on this without question and moving there. And Shell is too through the gas side, through the gas side, very, very strongly. Uh, and they've bought into the ethic, but also the ethic corresponds with you make money at it. And that's really important. You make money doing this. And that's moving them there quickly as well. And also too, become more in line with their stakeholders, their shareholders, who are putting more and more pressure on to move in this direction. No, you can't disinvest entirely tomorrow morning out of the industry. Obviously not. You can't do that. But how do you deal with that transition? They want their companies doing that. So, Henry, I, I think you might be surprised how much is actually going on. So I'm not going to steal Dave Waller's thunder from lunch, but he's going to talk a little bit about that. Um, but there's other companies, especially on the NOC side, uh, Stat Oils, big in this. 
Um, Shell's just made a utility purchase in the UK. Um, there, there's, and, and at CIRA, a theme there was, and I think Shell, the Shell CEO said by 2070, they want to be greenhouse gas emission free. That's 50 years away, okay? Um, and by 2050, I think it was like 80%, and 2030 it was still. Um, but, but there's actually a lot going on there, and I think the companies are looking to become energy companies. But there's a very big difference between that and, say, the independent sector in the U.S. And I think the reason the independent sector hasn't done it is, you know, there's the Harvard Business School stick to the knitting thing, and the U.S. independents have been fabulous at sticking to the knitting, and you want to create shareholder value. Uh, but some of the big international companies, I think, are moving there. And ExxonMobil is, um, is spending billions of dollars on carbon and carbon sequestration and trying to understand that. So there is a lot going on in this, and uh, I, uh, I, I think you'd be impressed uh, with the transition. Um, I don't know about the public perception when that comes around, but, but it's definitely going on. Jay, uh, we're done with panel one, and we turn it back over to you. All right. Well, thank you very much for the discussion. Gentlemen, it's a very interesting and thought-provoking discussion. I think I'd probably speak on behalf of everyone that, that we could sit and listen to you guys all day. Uh, very interesting. We appreciate it very much. But we have another panel we have to get to, and so we're going to take a, about a 10-minute break, reconvene at 10 o'clock. You'll love the second panel also. Thank you. <laughs>